Perfect, perfect. Okay, hi, hi, everyone. Um, so we are live on Zoom and we're live on Facebook. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, today's webinar is titled, What is the CCPIB Really Up To? We have an incredible lineup of speakers today. Um, so, so, so glad that we've been able to get together um, so many organizations um, to do this very, very important. Um, and little discussed um, webinars. So before we uh, start, I just want to let everyone know that we are going to be um, streaming in both English and Portuguese. We have um, uh, English speakers and we have Portuguese speakers and we do have translation um, and that can be very easily accessed by going to the bottom of the page and clicking on the globe and choosing the language that you would like um, to have uh, as the primary language that you want to be listening in. So I'm just going to uh, pass over to you and right now, who will just uh, say the same thing in Portuguese for those who are listening in Portuguese before the translation begins. Ewan? Not sure if Ewan can uh, can hear me, um, but we'll, 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 we'll give you all that message. Sim, yeah. escutando. Uh, muito obrigado, Bianca. Okay, wonderful. Hey, Thank you, Bianca. Welcome to all of you. We have translation to all the participants that listen to Portuguese. All you have to do is to press the button interpretation at the bottom of your screen and, and choose the language Portuguese. Thank you. Is the CCP IB really up to? And we're joined by Denise Motadel, by Adi Girota, by Kevin Scarrett, Rachel Small, and Fabiola Antizana. Uh, my name is Bianca Mujeni, and I'm based on the traditional territory of the Ganyangehaga people and the keepers of the Eastern Door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I also want to thank um, and acknowledge our co presenting organizations. Just Peace Advocates, World Beyond War, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, Internacional de Servicios Publicos, or PSI, the Canadian BDS Coalition, as well as Mining Watch Canada. We've also got some help behind the scenes um, from Karen Rodman, who's going to be posting lots of links um, and information in the chat um, for action and further information. Um, we've got you and Gibb. Um, who's going to be helping with the technical side of things. And we've also got our amazing translators, uh, Martina and Leno. So welcome to all of you. Also, I want to let folks at home know that the chat is open and we're looking very forward to hearing from you. Um, but please, as always, keep your comments civil um, and free from racist, sexist or otherwise harmful uh, commentary. Um, after our speakers give their initial remarks, we're going to open it up to uh, the audience for a Q&A. Please do post your questions in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom. It's way easier for us to find your questions there, and we'll get to as many as we can, time permitting. Uh, but we do have a lot of speakers today, uh, but hopefully we'll have uh, a little bit of time uh, for your questions as well. So really, really excited, really happy to bring together um, this, uh, you know, coalition of organizations and speakers to talk about a little discussed uh, aspect of Canada's uh, relations to the rest of the world. Um, most Canadians are invested in the Canadian Pension Plan, and the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, or CCPIB, as we'll be referring to it, CP, CPPIB rather, manages more than half a trillion dollars um, and this includes tens of billions of dollars in foreign investments. Uh, the CPPIB, however, is accountable first and foremost to the federal government and the provincial government, not the contributors uh, nor the beneficiaries. And the act that governs um, this body uh, dictates that the CPPIB um, must base its investment decisions solely on profit. Um, uh, so it's mandated to maximize returns with no restrictions uh, about how the CPPIB is invested in most of the world's um, largest weapons manufacturers. It is invested in companies that are complicit with Israeli war crimes. Uh, the Canadian Pension, uh, Pension Fund uh, has also been capitalizing on Jair Bolsonaro's privatization agenda in Brazil. And today, for example, we're going to be hearing um, quite a bit about the CPPIB's role in a major sell-off of a public water service uh, in Brazil, which Brazilian labor unions and human rights groups are challenging. Um, so through our mandatory CPP contributions here in Canada, 
um, most of us are trapped in complicity with these human rights abuses, uh, with the demise of democracy, with war, with arms, with apartheid, uh, with ecocide, and more. Um, but we don't hear about this in our mainstream media, and nobody is holding this body accountable, yet we are, uh, for the most part, all invested in this. So today's discussion is going to highlight the grave concerns um, that we do have about how our public pension funds are being invested and also what can be done to hold the CPPIB accountable uh, for the public pen pen pension funds um, that are entrusted to it. So uh, with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of, uh, of the evening, um, Kevin Skerritt. Kevin is the co-author of The Contradictions of Pension Fund Capitalism and is the Senior Research Officer uh, with, of Pensions with the Canadian Union of Public Employees, or QB, in Ottawa. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much, Bianca, and thank you to organizers. Uh, I'm sure people will let me know if, uh, if they can't hear me. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Karen Rodman and all of the people involved in the small group that got discussion of this event uh, uh, pulled together over the last number of months. Uh, and I'm just gonna say right off the top, uh, I am a researcher with Canadian Union of Public Employees, as Bianca said, for here tonight at the webinar, I'm gonna be speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of QP. Um, but I think a lot of what I say uh, is, is quite consistent with QP's views. So what I've been asked to do uh, tonight is just present uh, as briefly as I can uh, a kind of a big picture uh, overview of the structure uh, and the operations of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, uh, CPPIB, as Bianca says. So what I've done is I've prepared a set of slides uh, that I'm going to now share my screen to share with you all. Uh, I hope this can now, is this now visible? Yes, it is. Uh, and it is, uh, I only have eight slides, but these slides are going to present basically a few small snapshots of the size and the distribution of the investments of Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit in, in more detail about the issue that Bianca raised right off the bat, um, which is the mandate of the CPPIB and its mandate to maximize its rate of return. Uh, just as a last word uh, on my introduction, I will also say uh, I'm here based in Ottawa. I live in what's called Ottawa, which is uh, unceded and unsurrendered uh, Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. Uh, and I'm very happy to be uh, with everyone tonight. So, what is the CPPIB really up to and uh, how is it structured? As Bianca said, uh, this is a, an enormous pension fund. It is in fact the largest pension fund in Canada. Uh, it now, as of, it was reported just a month ago or two months ago, uh, it's recorded to have over half a trillion dollars. That's 500 $39 billion in assets, that's Canadian dollar value assets. For anyone who thinks in US dollar terms, uh, that is about 420 billion US dollars. Uh, it is simply enormous. Uh, and it has grown very quickly in the last 20 years. And this chart that I'm sharing here is showing that it is also projected to grow very quickly into a, a, a fund that's holding uh, first $1 trillion, then $2 trillion, and then eventually three and more. Uh, this is one of the largest pension fund investors in the world today. There's only a few in the world that are larger. I also wanna just, this next slide just provides a, a, a snapshot of how rapidly this fund has been growing over the last 20 years. Uh, I, I won't go into a detailed history, but I can share that this fund, this institution has actually only been in existence for about 23 years. It was launched in 1998, 1999, uh, out of a, a structure that, that previously uh, was invested very differently for the Canada Pension Plan. Uh, entirely in government bonds and in, in fact entirely in Canada. 
Canadian government bonds. Uh, you'll see here that this was recorded in 1999 as holding $36.5 billion. Uh, after seven years of its existence, the fund grew to $98 billion. And uh, as of 2020, it was $409 billion. And as I said, uh, as of this year, $539 billion, growing very, very rapidly for a number of structural reasons. Uh, I'll just add two other details. This chart that I'm showing on the left side uh, shows a little bit of detail about how these funds are invested, both in terms of categories of the assets that they are, it is invested in, but also in terms of the geography. You'll see it started as an entirely Canadian investment fund. Seven years later, it was still two thirds of the fund was held in Canada. And then there's a remarkable statistic showing at the bottom here, as of just two years ago, there was only 15% of this fund, 15.6% invested in Canada. That means the overwhelming majority of these monies are actually sent uh, to other jurisdictions for investment. And I would say increasingly in the global south, in uh, Asia and in Latin America. And I know that's going to come up uh, later in the webinar today. Uh, uh, I will just go into one more a little bit of detail uh, that I think is relevant for our overview snapshot. And that is uh, breaking down a little bit the different categories of what CPPIB invests in. I think a lot of us sort of think about a pension fund as something that invests in, you know, stocks and bonds, the sort of the traditional uh, understanding of uh, financial market investing. And it's true that CPPIB, its current holdings, have uh, stocks and bonds. Uh, in this list on the left side, this is showing that about 27% of the assets are invested in what's called public equities, essentially traded shares. And another 7% is invested in fixed income, which is essentially a, a category that's given to bonds. But what's remarkable in the, in the other categories showing is the very significant allocations to uh, what is called private equity. 32% of the fund is in private equity. That's essentially non-traded equity that is directly investing in different projects and companies. And then also these other categories that have grown very rapidly in recent years, uh, uh, in particular infrastructure and real estate. Almost 10% of the fund, of this $500 billion fund, is now invested in infrastructure. And of course, you know, I work for a public sector union. Uh, uh, we have a very strong attachment to public infrastructure and its importance in all of its dimensions. Uh, but over the last 20, 30 years, public infrastructure has been increasingly privatized uh, and handed over uh, the ownership and control to private owners and investors. That's essentially what this means. CPPIB has, has been increasing its allocation to exactly that category. And then the other uh, picture here is showing geographic breakdown. Where is this fund invested? Uh, it is still you know, significantly in uh, Canada and the United States, but you'll see that 26% uh, of the fund is invested in the Asia Pacific region and now 6% in Latin America. I can just say, because I know they, they trumpet this, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board is increasing its allocations in recent years to Latin America in particular. So let me speak just a, a, a little bit about the mandate for this board and the structure of it and, and, and what it's doing. It's, it's maybe important to, to just underline a point that Bianca made at the outset. This board, this institution is not a private pension plan uh, at all. It is in fact uh, structured legally as what we call in Canada, a crown corporation. It is essentially created by an act of the federal legislature uh, and, and effectively owned and controlled by the federal government. Federal government did this in the late 1990s in order to expand, uh, to, to establish an institution that would invest in private markets uh, as a way to have a, a buildup of assets 
that would be securing or attached to the promised benefits in the Canada pension plan that uh, the vast majority of Canadian workers participate in. But here's the thing. What they did when they established this Crown Corporation is they embedded in the legislation itself a requirement, a legal requirement explicitly set out that the mandate for its investments is to, and the quote is provided here, to invest its assets with a view to achieving a maximum rate of return without undue risk of loss. So risk is considered, but the mandate and the goal is it, it mandated is to maximize its rate of return. However, it is it decides it, it can do that and it is able to do that. Uh, now, we note here uh, in the slide that uh, this is money that is flowing into the board, essentially from workers and employers that are earning a pension for retirement. Uh, and, you know, it has been suggested that uh, there, are, there are broader interests of the Canadian workers that contribute to this plan that could also be considered, not simply the rate of return. Uh, for example, there's an interest in living in a world where labor rights and human rights and environmental and ecological concerns might be incorporated. Uh, but this is not, certainly th that kind of mandate is not made explicit, and there is some legal debate about the extent to which uh, the legislation that structures the board even permits a fulsome recognition of those rights and concerns. Important to underline that these assets, while, uh, while they are held by a federal government crown corporation, they are kept entirely separate and segregated from the government budget and, and, and the, the rest of government's assets. Uh, it is a segregated separate fund controlled separate from the federal government. Uh, the board of directors that oversees this crown corporation is essentially appointed by cabinet, uh, overseen by the Minister of Finance. And what they've done is effectively uh, appointed uh, financial experts, essentially people who are experienced with financial investing uh, from what we call in Canada Bay Street, uh, our equivalent of Wall Street. Uh, and uh, that's what they do. They operate as though this is not very different from a bank or a private equity fund or another asset manager. Uh, it really doesn't operate at all like a pension plan uh, traditionally would be underst understood to operate. Uh, and, you know, as Bianca said at the outset, the CPPIB, because of this structure, its accountability is actually to Parliament and to the federal government and not to contributors or beneficiaries. I will say uh, on this next slide, this, this is a little clip that comes out of their annual report. Uh, the CPPIB does incorporate in its considerations and its analysis of the risks that it faces, uh, the idea that some of its investments may have a impact on their reputation. And they are concerned about their reputation, which is you know, interesting to see uh, inside their own documentation and how they consider uh, the analysis of risk and the analysis of their, uh, the impact on their reputation. Uh, and in fact, I've pulled out just a, a, another quote from there annual report, uh, which basically it just refers to this concern. Uh, they acknowledge that reputation impacts uh, refer to the loss of uh, CPP investments credibility and brand value due to what might be internal or en external factors uh, as often related to or a consequence of uh, the other key uh, uh, rights and responsibilities. Uh, they acknowledge that harm to our reputation can lead to weakened public trust, weakened support uh, from CPP stewards, uh, or, and this is interesting to see, more intrusive oversight and political risk. <laughs> so they're acknowledging that if they uh, are involved in investments and practices that generate controversy, 
that this is a real risk because they could actually trigger government action or policy. I just have a couple of last slides to, to wrap up this overview. Uh, uh, the second last slide, I just want to reassure anybody who is uh, thinking about this large fund and the responsibilities involved. If any of you are worried about whether or not the senior executives that are charged with overseeing this board uh, might not be paid enough, might not get enough compensation for these responsibilities, I can assure you that uh, they are, in fact, very well compensated. This annual report shows that the CEO of CPPIB, a guy named John Graham, uh, for 2022, his total compensation is reported at $5.3 million. Uh, and interesting to note, uh, that's an increase from just under $3 million in 2021. So a very substantial increase. These are uh, increases that are well beyond the increases that are seen, uh, you know, of course, by most workers. Uh, just, you know, worth taking stock of, uh, uh, of this kind of structure and, and compensation. Last point, and I know my time is running out. Uh, I just want to conclude here. Uh, one of the things that I have focused on uh, in my role for uh, the work that I do and uh, in other research is the, the role that CPPIB and other pension funds have played in uh, buying up public infrastructure and, and in fact, helping advance projects of privatization of infrastructure. And I, and I find this, uh, this quote very powerful, uh, which is a public quote from one of the senior executives of CPPIB responsible for Latin America. He's actually advocating that Brazil and other Latin American countries uh, pursue further the privatization agenda. He says it's important that the concession and privatization agenda in Brazil continues to advance and that it is able to attract long-term capital. Governments in Latin America have to progress in terms of economic reforms in order to attract private sector investments. This is a, a senior executive with the CPPIB saying this publicly to reporters. Uh, I think that tells us a lot and I think that might help set up the discussion that uh, I think we're going to have uh, with uh, our comrades from Brazil uh, and uh, from other speakers tonight. So I think with that, uh, Bianca, I'll stop there and hand it back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, thanks for sharing that rigorous research and for following this Crown Corporation, as you've reminded us um, of its status so closely, and um, just for providing a very clear backdrop for today's uh, discussion, and also for that that call call for accountability. This fund is huge, um, as you said, and it's growing, and it has faced little scrutiny. Um, but there are vulnerabilities um, that you've pointed to. So education and action around their investments is vital. So next, we're going to be hearing from several speakers in Brazil um, about the power and water sell-offs and the CPPIB's in investment uh, in these privatizations. So first, uh, I'd like to welcome our next panelist, Denise Motadao. Welcome, Denise. Obrigada. Boa noite a todos os companheiros e companheiras que participam deste debate tão importante para a classe trabalhadora brasileira. Inicialmente, acho que é importante pegar o, o gancho que a Bianca deu na introdução que ela falou, de que nós estamos, como ela disse, numa agenda de privatização do governo Bolsonaro no Brasil. Então, é um governo de ultradireita, bastante conservador em relação a direitos civis, sociais, trabalhistas, coletivos. É, inclusive, prega uma agenda bastante conservadora do ponto de vista dos direitos das mulheres, da população LGBTQIA+, da população gay, é um governo de uma postura bastante racista, vem trazendo, um, vem fazendo um forte desinvestimento, um forte corte. We, we need to stop and uh, turn translation back on. Uh, something has happened that has turned it off. 
Okay. We uh, actually need to start at the back. At hello, the hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear. Now I can hear. Translation is back okay. up. Thank you. Okay, but can you ask her to start again? Yeah. Uh, Denise, Denise, can you hear me? Oh. I think we, I think we'll just, I think it's best we just proceed. Okay, okay. The situation of the country that uh, we had a coup against President um, Joma Rousseff and speaking about the general culture, speaking about privatization in the last time period, water companies or utilities based on the law approved in the National Congress where Bolsonaro has the majority based on a new legislation that dismantled water and sewage in Brazil, we had uh, a victory on that aspect and now we don't have any more. Also the water and sewage companies such as SEDAI in Rio de Janeiro, the state com company. And we have Ari Girota, our brother here, our comrade, who is the president of the Water Trade uh, Employees Trade Union here. The, it was put placed in together with the negotiation of the federal government. So the federal government said that if the government of Rio de Janeiro wants to have a, a loan to balance their finances, they will have to privatize their water and sewage company. So Sedai, the water company in Rio, a very good public company or utility that was very profitable, very good, very effective, was privatized. Now we have the, this whole uh, movement to privatize the electricity company, the Electrobras for the, all of Brazil. We would like to mention that the struggle against the privatization of Electrobras comes from 2017. There were provisional uh, uh, provisional measures that tried to uh, privatize it, but now recently it has been approved, and the uh, stocks of Electrobras were sold. So they are also trying to privatize our huge oil and gas company, Petrobras. Uh, this has come, this is starting since the coup that, uh, that took away, um, took the office from President uh, Juma Rousseff. So now we have the threats of, uh, of not having universal services for everyone. The PSI, Public Services International in Brazil has a research to, together with the Transnational Institute that has been showing that the privatization of water, energy and education services in the country was not efficient. And we've been having several experience of restating these uh, utilities because the fees were went up. The companies that bought these services did not implement the expansion and the access of the expansion of the access to these services had no social concern. And so the governments most, most of the time have dialogues with the population. And in certain countries, not all, some countries are beginning a wave of initiatives for remunicipalization of such utility companies and uh, restating them, uh, becoming state-owned again. So 
not only for those who work in the services that lost the rights, but the society in general lost its rights too. Now, coming to the conclusion of my speech, we are very worried now with the participation of the Canadian Pension Fund in buying these companies. First of all, because it's something that harms our society. It's not something good. It's harmful to the Brazilian population that is already undergoing many difficulties. Also, this is the money from workers that has been used to harm the working class in Brazil. And immediately after the privatization of the water company in Rio de Janeiro, we, we spoke to the CPPIB and they were in solidarity with us. They understood our, our cause. They went publicly, they spoke, they challenged the use of the pension fund, the money from Canadian workers to privatize a water utility in Rio de Janeiro. And now they are in solidarity, putting pressure on the pension fund about this participation in the buying of the Electrobras, the energy company of, uh, for Brazil. So this dialogue with you is very important so we can have a structure for resistance. And our conclusion is what we were saying. We, we have in the pension fund experts that think about risk analysis or assessment. And, and in terms of the reputation, we have these arguments that it's not good to privatize because of the society, because of the factors I have mentioned. But we are in Brazil about to have elections in October, presidential elections. And the candidate from the democratic popular field, Lula, the, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, he is the first one in the polls, in the researches. So if he is elected, he will work on the uh, re uh, rebuying those companies for the to be state owned again. So why would we do this now? Be if further on we are going to uh, Remunicipalize the company or re uh, buy it again for the state. So it's going to be a state owned company. It, this is not beneficial to the population under the commercial point of view of profit. It's a great risk because we have a, a, the possible new president is very willing to buy the company again to become state owned again. So it's a risk uh, to invest money on these com on, on the Electrobus. Many other public services may count on investments and, and the buying of stocks on the part of the CPPIB. So this dialogue we are having here with you is very, very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's very troubling to hear about the direction that these uh, privatizations are going in and uh, the likely impacts, but it is heartening to hear about the solidarity that is building um, between Brazil and Canada on, on this issue. Um, I just a quick note to let uh, folks know that everyone who is registered for uh, this webinar will get a replay of this event, um, which we will be posting to YouTube and also Facebook. So if you want to rewatch or if you've missed anything, don't worry, we will send you all uh, a replay. Um, so our next panelist of the evening is Adi Girota. Adi is president of uh, Sindagua-RJ, the Water Purification, Distribution and Sewage Workers Union of Natiroi in Brazil. Welcome, Adi.
Hi, Adi. Can you hear me? I think Adi is driving. All right, maybe maybe we'll go Girota. to Girota. Oh, Girota. My, my bad, my bad. É, boa noite a todos e todas. Peço desculpa por questão em trânsito, atividade I... sindical. Good evening to all of you. I'm sorry because I'm in transit. The trade union activity has no schedules, especially at moments of privatization. I was doing an activity about the sanitation workers right now, so I'm in transit, but it's an honor to be here with all of you. I would like to thank you publicly and thank Denise, the PSI and the trade union of the Canadian workers because it made a lot of difference in the struggle and resistance that we showed as workers from the state water and uh, sewage company, SEDAI. For us, us, it's a symbol of resistance. So I'd like to leave my thanks uh, on behalf of more than 5,000 workers from the state-owned company SEDAI. But unfortunately, this process that happened in Rio de Janeiro, from which the CPPIB is part through the company Igua, one of the companies that undertook part of the of the SEDAI systems is they had no criteria to preserve and respect the rights of the workers. So, so that you have an idea of what I'm saying, today we are running the risk of having a massive uh, layoff uh, uh, of the workers in Rio de Janeiro because along the process of giving back, giving the company away or this buyout, oh, his sound has disappeared. I'm sorry. His sound is disappeared. Adi, we can't hear. We ah, can't okay, hear. he's back. He's back. We have the re we are running the risk of laying off 3,500 workers and families. So the company that is undertaking the system, Igua, does not, con not consider the possibility of using these same workers from the state owned company because because the wages of a public service company are higher. The, therefore, they are wages that were achieved with a long time with the struggle of the workers. Therefore, they have a better condition and better living conditions for the civil service servants, just like what happens in Canada, uh, the workers that are part of the pension fund, and today they can enjoy the, the process of their funds and, and pension funds and retirement funds. This must be reviewed by the owners of this pension fund because they are the workers, but you cannot invest the money of the workers and cause harm and suffering with drawing rights and lowering the living conditions of other workers. And most of all, in the case of the water, of the water companies, public water companies in Brazil that are being attacked and being privatized. Um, so this means suffering for the population because if an investment fund, and I would like to say that we understand that when you want to invest, you want to have the best uh, profit. It's a, it's a rationale. 
but you should combine this with the access to water and sanitation in ultimately we are speaking about access guarantee of life and health for these populations so i understand as a worker as the president of the trade union sindagua and as an a militant and activist of social movements that the orientation and the stance that must be given to these actors that earn the money and are remunerated to, to do the investment and to uh, ensure a, a good uh, profit for the workers of the pension fund. We understand that they can invest, but not investment that will produce a poverty and suffering for other workers. And, and other populations are having need to have the right to work. They must have their full rights to life and what, what their work can offer as a benefit to society. And since we witness the investments that are being carried out by the fund, the pension fund, CPPIB, in Brazil especially, they are having as a consequence the production of wealth for just a few and poverty for many. His sound is gone. Now we Comrades, the process of privatization in Brazil is going on fast. And so we need somehow to have the international community support us, understand our situation and help us. And Dilma Rousseff had a coup d'etat. It was a coup on the president and on the people of Brazil. So they implemented neoliberal policies after the coup. And we must challenge the fact that they got a hold of the assets of water, and now they want to get a hold of the energy through the privatization of Eletrobras. So we understand that the Canadian government cannot be an accomplice of that and be silent to this kind of action because the barbarianism is already established in Brazil. You all know that uh, the, the English journalist Don Phillips and Bruno um, Ribeiro, who are, they were murdered in the Amazon region because they were defending the rights of the indigenous population in their ter uh, defending their ter territory. Because of this kind of policy, the Canadian government must take a stance in the perspective of avoiding the barbarianism to be perpetuated in Brazil. And this must be a very clear stance, a very clear position, so that as workers in Brazil, we can continue to admire the example of fight for struggles, of a fight and struggles for rights in Canada. We really admire your struggles. It's a great pleasure to be here with so many fighters and activists that want to go forward in the same perspective, humanizing our world again and guaranteeing rights for all the workers. And in the search for equality and justice, 
I apologize because I'm in transit and so maybe the sound is not so good, but I couldn't do differently. It's an honor to be with all of you. And I will continue now to drive on the road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Adi. Thank you so much for taking the time. He, he's to asking to translate. He's, I cannot read English, so you can yes. translate to me if possible. Yeah, so um, uh, I don't know if Adi has the uh, the translation switched on. If not, um, I don't think that Adi is going to hear the translation. Um, <clears throat> but uh, maybe someone can send him uh, a message about that. So thank you so much to Adi. Um, sorry, Adi, that you can't uh, understand what I'm saying right now, but hopefully someone will translate for this, this for you at some point. Really glad that you took the time out to come and share, uh, talk to us um, during your incredibly busy schedule. Thanks for your important work and um, for just this the, the, the call to action and for challenging these investments that are gonna cause all of this suffering and impoverishment, lowered work conditions and more. And um, and yeah, and just for that, that rousing call to challenge the CPPIB's bid to capitalize on Bolsonaro's privatization agenda. Solidarity. So next up, we'll be hearing from uh, Fabiola Antizana, who Antizana, who's the vice president of the National Co Confederation of Urban Workers in Brazil. Welcome, Fabiola. Good evening, brothers and sisters. First, I uh, want to thank Denise that allowed me to be here with you tonight. I also want to thank the organizers. Um, Fabiola from the National Confederation of Urban Workers in Brazil, that since the coup against President Dilma, we've been fighting the privatization of Eletrobras, the biggest electricity generation and transmission company in Latin America with nuclear farms and a binational agreement and they also have a research center in electricity that's internationally recognized and what stood out in the process of privatization of Electrobras and that's something that we discussed with Denise when the first words got published about the participation of CBPIB in the acquisition of Electrobras stocks. That was a model chosen by the government, so it was not a regular privatization as we were used to in Brazil, where a company was sold. They chose to sell stocks to try to create what they call a corporation. And that's something that's being, that is being widely used across the world. But in the specific case of Electrobras, this is not a corporation. They created an aberration because the new shareholders, regardless of the amount of stocks that they might purchase, would not be be able to have the power to vote above 10 percent so they established limits in such a way that simply would not was no longer applicable to what we know as a corporation in the in its classical form as it exists in several other segments and sectors in the specific case of Electrobras, um it poses a very emblematic situation. Denise asked us about the situation that we're currently experiencing in Brazil. Well, in a country with millions of people at the brink of misery, millions of people starving, dying because of the sequelas of the pandemic, uh, experiencing huge increases 
in the energy tariffs and fuel prices which are raw materials for the development of any country a high level of unemployment in brazil the flexibilization of workers rights to hide this unemployment and amidst this entire process they talk about privatizing Eletrobras in the middle of a pandemic where in Brazil there wasn't a single public hearing, one single public discussion, not even remotely to discuss the impacts of privatizing Eletrobras, not only on the Brazilian population, but also on the Latin American countries, because our way to produce energy is based on hydroelectricity, as is the case with Canada. So our water resources are not geographically limited by the borders. We interfere in all of the neighboring countries and the privatization of Electrobras will also create impacts for these neighboring countries. And none of that was discussed in the federal Senate, there was a live uh, purchase of the votes of Congress people on screen where a Congress person would say that they would vote against the process. And then the rapporteur would say, well, I, but I uh, met your demands and amendments and the amendments were related to selling more expensive thermal power plant uh, electricity that were, were added to the Brazilian grid and necessarily just to guarantee the votes uh, that the votes that guaranteed the privatization of Electrobras. So at the Senate, we had four votes for additional votes with no public discussion involving society. So there was no public discussion and uh, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't any discussion with the acquirers of, of these stocks uh, about the fact that we have investments to make that we uh, also had to uh, make a company public to privatize Electrobras, bringing a huge risk to the electricity sector in Brazil. And uh, one of our undertakings is called Santo Antonio in Brazil. They used to say they like to say that Eletrobras did not have investment capacity. But the truth is the Brazilian model since 2004 provides for the expansion of the electrical industry by means of PPPs and a private the private sector historically will never invest in infrastructure by itself. It needs the Brazilian state to invest not only financially, but also being the sponsor of all of the commitments they undertake. So it was very good to see in the chat a manifestation by Maximiliano Garces uh, there was an office that uh, was hired by CNE uh, since 2017. We filed se a series of uh, lawsuits every year. Uh, we made several reports in Brazil and internationally about this process. And a lot of what uh, President Lula says, and we call it like that because he's ahead in the uh, pre-election surveys. And when the campaign starts, we will go public because we cannot continue with this horrible government who will uh, support uh, President Lula. And uh, we've been saying that it is these illegalities and inconsistencies that will allow us to go backwards and to regenerate the situation. So in our, our concern is that in this specific case of CPPIB, that they say they uh, invested resources, but it was impossible for us to verify that in the official list of the official stack stockholders of shareholders of Electrobras, they released a list of eight names and the uh, remaining 57% are under others. 
So it's so diluted that we can't really tell who the shareholders are. But what we know is that most of them are among the current friends of President Bolsonaro, that the group of the Ministry of uh, the uh, Ministry of Finance also grew a lot and became one of the biggest controlling groups in Electrobras, and that all almost all of the administrators involved in the privatization process that were in the federal government or inside Electrobras either um, quit or were terminated right after the process. We have several lawsuits underway at the Supreme Court and uh, first and second level lawsuits that were not even judged. And we have the clarity that going backwards involves demonstrating these illegalities. And with that, there will be loss to those that purchased these stocks. I haven't mentioned uh, what this means in terms of loss of sovereignty for Brazil or what it means in terms of the multiple use of waters because in Canada you own this discussion better than we do so much so that we went backwards in terms of where the world is moving to the multiple use of waters is what allowed uh, them to privatize the generation and for it to remain state-owned and here unfortunately it was delivered to a series of private investors that are not the groups that usually invest resources and therefore that's why it caught at our attention as well these are not classical groups of investors but rather groups that seem to be closer to those that had access to this information so thank you for the possibility of joining this discussion i am available if you have any questions and uh, hopefully the workers of Canada won't uh, have uh, won't see any harm to their investments, but uh, indeed there must be a better control of how the money, the lifetime savings, are invested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fabiola. Thank you for all those details, um, for educating us, and um, and also just for pushing back uh, against this violation of the right to water, electricity, proper sanitation. Um, and pushing back against these illegal actions. Um, it's it's terrible to hear about the ways in which the Canadian government is actively uh, involved in facilitating um, this privatization agenda in Brazil. Um, so thank you so much to Fabiola um, and to Adi um, and to Denise as well, who are all uh, speaking to us from, from Brazil. Well, I look forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A shortly. So the next speaker of the evening is Catherine Ravi. Um, Catherine is a business and human rights legal researcher with Al Haq in Palestine. Welcome, Catherine. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's been, I'll echo it, it's an honor to be here and it's wonderful learning from all of you. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, as uh, Bianca mentioned, I'm Catherine, I'm in uh, Palestine uh, as we speak. It's a bit in the middle of the night, so I apologize if my voice is not very clear. Um, but I really want to, um, I know we have limited time, so I will, um, I'm going to really direct this conversation on one specific company um, that is involved in the active um, suppression of the Palestinian people. Um, but first, it's important to just take kind of a wide view approach and understand that um, a, a huge factor in how the occupying power of Israel um, sustains its apartheid regime over Palestinians is through the use of illegal settlements. Um, so this is the dispossession and displacement of Palestinians and their land. Um, and it's, uh, it's a key feature to Israel's settlement enterprise. Um, so Palestinian land and property is regularly being subjected to confiscation and demolition and Israel's prolonged occupation and colonization of Palestine has created this deeply entrenched regime of systematic uh, discrimination, segregation, um, and of course apartheid. So uh, the company WSP, which is a head, which head is headquartered in Montreal. Um, substantially contributes to the maintenance and existence of these illegal settlements um, in the occupied Palestinian territories. And this is done through its ongoing support um, and extension of the Jerusalem light rail system. Uh, so 
WSP is providing services to this train line between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, uh, which crosses the Green Line into occupied Palestinian land. And I know hearing this on a Zoom call, it's difficult to visualize, but essentially um, Israel, which is already occupying Palestinian land, is using this railway system to essentially um, take over uh, this occupied Palestinian land by connecting illegal settlements to one another um, and to these to larger cities such as Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. So WSP has been contracted to plan and design this light rail system um, and services all of these illegal settlements um, and really provides um, the sustainment and the managing of its development, um, as well as uh, its electrification for all of Israel's um, railway system. And WSP has been providing this engineering and managing services uh, to Israeli markets since 1995. And because Israel, uh, the railway sector is heavily dependent on foreign manufacturers for the supplying of, of vehicles and trucks um, and signaling and tunneling, it's really crucial for Israel to look to privatization to sustain this expansion of, uh, of their railway system. Uh, and they do that through international companies like WSP. Um, now, the CPPIB invests in WSP um, a huge amount, and, and actually that investment has even grown within the last um, annual um, report, and annual investment. So currently, their investment is um, $2,953 million. So as Kevin mentioned earlier, these are huge numbers. Um, and its impact is greatly felt all throughout the occupied territories. S due to, its, to, to WSP's involvement in the Jerusalem light rail extension, it's involved in gross and systematic violations of fundamental human rights for Palestinians. Uh, and the Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council, has even deemed this railway system illegal and in clear violation of international law. Further, Canada's own policy actually uh, even indicates that it does not recognize these uh, permanent Israeli controlled lands um, and it recognizes the illegality of these settlements that it then funds through uh, under the door and through this, this privatization of companies like WSP. Um, and it's important to note that this illegality, what I'm talking about, these violations of international law happen in three major ways. The first is the appropriation of property. So the land that the light rail requires to connect all of these settlements together um, is in breach of the Geneva Convention but also results in the destruction of homes, uh, a lack of ability to, for Palestinians to, to use agricultural lands, which has massive economic repercussions um, for the Palestinian population. Um, and it also goes against HAG regulations, which pro prohibits the uh, privatization and, and pillage, essentially, of private land of, um, under occupying powers. The second way is through the transfer of civilian populations. So this railway essentially contributes to the maintenance and expansion of the Israeli population into Palestinian land. Um, it enhances the quality of life of these illegal settlers, which fosters and facilitates the movement um, all throughout the occupied Palestinian territories. And it deepens the social uh, economic integration of these settlements into, uh, into the, uh, Israel's occupying um, land, which is, of course goes against the Fourth Geneva Convention. Um, and of course, WSP is actively participating and profiting from this transfer of citizens, which is in blatant violation of international humanitarian law. And finally, what this ultimately does is furthers a settler colonialism within the occupied Palestinian territories. So um, through this illegal settlement uh, enterprise, WSP is seriously undermining an array of fundamental human rights, including the freedom to movement, property, family home, 
education, etc. cetera. Um, I will quick, as a side note, say WSP is obviously not the only company that uh, the CPPIB invests in um, that contributes to this illegal settlement enterprise. Um, it also contributes to uh, General Mills, Derrick, which is an oil trading company, um, through different internet facilitations, Airbnb, um, Expedia, all of these things. Although WSP certainly uh, retains a, a large amount of their of their profits and funding. Um, I know that it's been amazing in the comments to see everyone suggesting different ideas of how to combat this. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar, well, I'm, I'm sure you are, with the UN database on businesses involved in illegal Israeli settlement enterprises. So this is a database that was created by the Human Rights Council to um, list all of the companies actively involved in this illegal Israeli center, uh, enterprise. Um, this is a very powerful to, uh, business enterprises that are involved. Peace Advocates and Al Haq have been working on a submission um, to have WSP added to this database. Um, and this database is useful because we can then use it to lobby our governments and, um, and other institutions to divest and sanction and boycott all of these um, types of businesses. Um, which is nothing, it's a difficult battle of course, but it is a, a worthy one. and one of great power. I will simply also, I will add before my time is up, I will simply say, you know, as it's been mentioned in the comments, uh, we have to understand that uh, we are up against a huge neoliberal machine that is actively profiting um, from these human rights violations, um, which obviously directly goes back to their corporate funders as uh, and CEOs, as Kevin pointed out. So, you know, it's going to take an entire cultural shift um, from people in all parts of the world, especially Canada, to um, ex set expectations from their governments um, on how, on, on really addressing the human rights impact of economic reforms, um, which is a, a budding uh, feature of international law. Um, and the UN actually has its own principles on this exact topic. So there is movement, but it will take, uh, it, it takes international solidarity, uh, which has always been a linchpin of change. Um, and it is difficult, but it's um, certainly important. So I thank you all for being here and listening to this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, thank you for your work and for that call for the Canadian pension plan to divest from Israeli war crimes um, and to stop profiting from human rights violations. Um, thank you for also for providing that import, important case study, um, WSP, um, you know, which is operating legally uh, in settlements and the implications um, on uh, people's lives. So uh, just a piece of background information in 2021, over 70 organizations uh, did call on the CPPIB to divest from companies listed in the UN uh, database um, that Catherine mentioned um, that are complicit with war crimes and 5,000 letters were sent by concerned citizens. But uh, despite a promise in March 2021 um, by the CPPIB uh, for review, there, there has been no word. Um, if you visit Just Peace Advocates website, you can read about how the 2022 CPPIB year end results actually show an increased um, public pension investment in Israeli war crimes. So um, Karen, I think, can post the chat, the, the, uh, the link in the chat. So our final speaker of the evening. I'm so happy to be able to introduce Rachel Small. Rachel is Canada organizer for World Beyond War. Rachel has also organized with, uh, within local and international social environmental justice movements for over a decade, with a special focus on working in solidarity with communities harmed by extractive industry projects in Latin America. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Bianca, and, and thank you so much to everyone. Thank you for to Catherine for joining at like 3 a.m. So appreciative of, to have you here. Um, my name is Rachel Small. I'm the Canada organizer with World Beyond War. We're a global grassroots network and movement advocating for the abolition of war. Um, we have members in 192 countries worldwide. We're all taking concrete steps to build alternatives. Um, 
and and I'm thrilled to be speaking at this event and thrilled to be at the end when maybe we we can start to move towards what might an alternative be. Um, I myself am based in Tugurundo, often called Toronto, which I imagine like many of the cities people here are joining from is built on stolen Indigenous land. But I also want to say that Toronto is the seat of Canadian finance. It's where the CPPIB is itself based for anti-capitalist organizers in this city or those involved in mining injustice. We often call it the belly of the beast. Um, and so much of the wealth in this city and indeed, in the whole country, I want to note, has been stolen from Indigenous people. So when we're talking about investing the wealth of, of Canadians and so forth, let's also remember that so much of that has come from removing Indigenous people from their land, often to then extract materials to build wealth, whether that's through clear-cutting forests or mining or oil and gas. I think that is a theme underneath everything we're talking about today, the ways in which um, on many levels, the CPP continues colonization, both across Turtle Island and also as discussed in Palestine and the Global South, et cetera. So um, I only have a few minutes, so I, I, I want to build on what some of the other panelists have said and also talk about other areas of CPP investment. As Kevin laid out right at the beginning, this pension fund, it's not small fries. It's one of the largest in the world. and um, one of its major areas of investment is in the weapons industry. So as per the numbers that were just recently released in their annual report, CPP currently invests in nine of the world's top 25 arms companies. Um, this includes Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Airbus, L3 Harris, Harris Honeywell, uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, General Electric, fails, probably more as well in, in sort of slightly less obvious and indirect ways, but those are the sort of the public holdings. Um, to put it frankly, these are the companies that are literally the world's biggest war profiteers, right? And the same conflicts around the world that many of us have been watching with horror in the news that have brought misery to millions of people have brought these same companies record-breaking profits this year. So the millions of people around the world who are being killed, who are being displaced, who are suffering, are doing so as a direct result of the weapons sold and the military deals made by these corporations. These corporations are not the only bodies that are responsible for this suffering, but their weapons are at the core of it. Um, yeah, otherwise put, while more than 6 million refugees have fled Ukraine this year so far, while more than 400,000 civilians have been killed in over seven years of war in Yemen, while um, over 13 Palestinian children were killed in the West Bank since the start of 2022, these companies are raking in billions in profits. They are the ones who are winning these wars. I would argue they are the only ones who are winning these wars. And this is where so much of so many of our funds are being invested. So whether we like it or not, all of us who have some of our wages taken by and invested by the CPP are literally investing in maintaining and enlarging this industry. Um, Lockheed Martin, for instance, is the world's top weapons maker, major investments by CPP, and their stocks have soared nearly 25% this year. Um, and this connects with many other aspects of Canadian militarism and government policy. Just this past March, the Canadian government announced that Lockheed Martin was the lucky company that was gonna be making 88 new bomber jets for the Canadian military. Um, bomber jets whose only, their, whose only purpose is to kill, to destroy infrastructure. They'll be nuclear weapon capable. These are war fighting machines. Um, and this type of decision to purchase 88 of these jets for a total of over $77 billion. This is us entrenching a Canadian foreign policy based on a commitment to wage war via warplanes for decades to come. Same way when we invest in building new pipelines, we're entrenching a future of fossil fuel extraction and climate crisis. So I, on, on one hand, I am talking about different things here. I'm talking about the Canadian government military decision to buy 
fighter jets, but then I think it's important to connect that with the ways that our pension funds, supposedly so separate, is also investing many millions of dollars um, constantly in the same company. Uh, and so the many ways that we are giving Lockheed Martin um, some of their record-breaking billions in profits these year. I should also say all but two of those nine top 25 global weapons companies that I mentioned that the CPP is investing in, all but two of those are significantly involved in the production of nuclear weapons globally. Um, and I'm not even including sort of indirect investments in nuclear weapons producers. I won't talk too much about nuclear weapons, but maybe suffice it to say that there are more than 13,000 nuclear warheads on the planet today, many on high alert status, ready to be launched within minutes. Um, any such launch, but a catastrophic consequences for life on Earth. There's, there's no hyperbole. There's no exaggeration there. They, they literally pose an immediate threat to human survival. And there have been many accidents <laughs> involving these weapons that luckily have not been catastrophic, but there have been accidents in the US, in BC, <laughs> in Spain, in Russia, elsewhere over decades. Um, and maybe once we're on this uh, depressing <laughs> topic of threats to human survival, I do want to briefly highlight, because it hasn't come up as much today, uh, the climate change, uh, or I should say that fossil fuels are another major area of CBP investment, that CBP is deeply invested in the climate crisis. Um, we're talking about billions of our retirement dollars in companies that are currently expanding oil, gas, coal infrastructure, and in many cases, pension funds actually owning these pipelines, oil and gas companies, offshore gas fields, etc., and I saw that it came up in the chat box as well before that the CPP is a huge investor as well in mining companies, which not only are in many cases continuing colonization, responsible for land theft and contamination, but also mining itself, the extraction of metals, um, the processing of metals is itself responsible for over a quarter of global carbon emissions. So over, over 26% of global carbon emission also comes from the mining industry. That's separate from the oil and gas industry. So basically on many uh, levels, this, this the CPP is investing in what we know will make the planet literally unlivable for future generations, not so future, like possibly my generation, as well as they are putting out tons of materials that I frankly would call greenwashing, um, sort of bragging about the ways that they're talking about achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions, possibly by 2050, too little, too late, um, and frankly looks a lot more like greenwashing for me than actually committing to keep fossil fuels in the ground, which is what we know we need. I want to make also a brief point about this idea of CPP independence that has been touched on. The CPP does stress that they're independent of governments, that they report to a board of directors, and it's that board that approves their investment policies, their direction, key decisions, etc. But I want to briefly highlight that of this on this board, of its 11 current uh, members of the board of directors, at least six of those have worked directly for or been on the boards of fossil fuel companies and their direct financiers. So notably, I won't go into all 11 of them, but the chairperson of the board, Heather Monroe Bloom, who uh, has been on the board for over 12 years now, she's also sat during that same time on the board of RBC, which is of course the number one lender to Canada's fossil fuel sector. Um, so perhaps more than almost any other institution in Canada, aside from oil companies themselves, I would say RBC has the most deeply vested interest in seeing fossil fuel production grow. It's the major funder of the coastal gasling pipeline shoving through Wet'suwet'en territory right now. RBC is also a major investor in the nuclear weapons industry. So it doesn't even need to be sort of a formal conflict of interest, but clearly, Heather's experience on the board of RBC informs the way that she feels the CPP uh, IB should be run, 
types of investments that are secure. Um, and, so, and so these are the people that the board is made up of. These are the people who are making these decisions. Um, they say on their website that their purpose is to, uh, well, in fact, it's the second line of their annual report that says that their focus is to safeguard the best interests of CPP beneficiaries for generations. Uh, it says the same thing basically at the top of their website, that their goal is to create retirement security for many generations of Canadians. But I think fundamentally, we have to ask ourselves, why is it that an institution that's mandatory for the majority of Canadian workers to contribute to, that's set up ostensibly to help secure our futures and that of our children, seems to instead be funding and actually bringing about immense present day and future destruction, um, especially considering nuclear involvements, climate change, that is funding the literal end of the world, um, or at least of a livable planet for humans. Funding death, funding fossil fuel extraction, water privatization, war crimes. The, I would argue these are not only terrible investments morally, they're also bad investments financially, if you look at the broad picture of where the oil industry is going. I think that a pension fund that's actually focused on the future of workers in this country would not be making the decisions the CPPIB is doing, and that we should not accept the current state of affairs um, or accept something that prioritizes Canadian workers while throwing people across the world under the bus. I think we need to lean into the international solidarity that my pre the previous panelists spoke to. Um, I think we need to demand nothing less than a fund that's actually invested in the future we want to live in. I don't think that's a radical proposition. I think that's logical. Um, and I and I stand by that 100%. But I also want to be honest that I think this is a really tricky battle ahead. Uh, we're beyond war as an organization does many divestment campaigns and wins many every year whether divesting city budgets from fossil fuels in the war machine or worker or private pension plans. But I want to be honest that the CPP is a tricky one. It's deliberately designed to be incredibly difficult to change. Um, many will say impossible to change, but I don't think that's true. Many will also say that, oh, they're completely shielded from political influence. They're completely unconcerned about and separate from public pressure. I think we know that's not entirely true. And I think Kevin did a great job earlier of showing how much they actually do care about their reputation in the eyes of the Canadian public. So I think that creates a small sliver of opening for us. It means that I think we can actually force them to change. I think we often want sort of direct, immediate steps we can take. What is the action plan? But I think tonight is an important step. I think we do have to start by understanding what they're doing on the path to building broad movements to change it. And there could be many approaches to that. And I hope some of that will come up in the discussion, but I do wanna highlight something that I think also came up in the chat, which is that every two years, they do hold public meetings across the country, usually one in every province or territory, or almost every, um, and this fall is when that will happen again. So I think that is a key moment where we can organize intersectionally, where we can show actually we don't have confidence in the decisions they're making, their reputation is at risk. And where again, I think we should demand nothing less than a fund that's invested in and actually building the future that we want to live in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, thank you for asking those vital questions and for that rousing call to action. It's profoundly disheartening um, to know that our pension plan uh, is so heavily invested in war and uh, by extension, suffering, displacement, um, death through these weapons and military deals. And I think many people living in Canada would be appalled to know that these dangerous projects are being funded um, with our retirement income. So I do want to encourage participants to take action, um, as Rachel has called on, um, and to call for a fund that does invest in our future and not, and not the end of the world. Um, so with that, we are, uh, we're now in our question and answer period. We have very little time um, for this, um, but I am going to take uh, just a few questions. Um, if any of our panelists do have to leave, I totally understand. Um, so the first uh, question, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, people, for, uh, for posting your questions in the Q&A. There's lots of them. There's lots of great questions, um, but unfortunately, I can only get to a few of them. The first question that we have is, uh, is from Jamie Neen, who is with uh, Mining Watch um, Canada. 
His question is for the Canadian panelists, and he wants to know what steps or actions can we take as Canadians, as CPPIB beneficiaries, as workers? We obviously need to try to stop the worst successes of the CPPIB, but ultimately, can the CPP be restrained, reformed, or reinstated as it was pre-1996, or especially in the context of precarious work, should we be working towards a different model of support for retired uh, and non-working people, or do we need both? Um, who would like to uh, take a stab at this? Excellent question from Jamie. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, yeah, I'll just take a quick stab. Uh, this has come up a little in the chat as well. I'll just acknowledge the point. And, you know, I, I posted somewhere that I think we should. I agree with all of those who are suggesting we, you know, crash their public meetings and bring pressure directly to bear on the board. But I also just want to underline uh, what I was some of what I said at the outset. This thing is structured to be a profit machine on a massive scale. <laughs> and it is legally obligated to do that. It is a capitalist financial institution seeking profits wherever they can be found. And I think, you know, and, and, and now Canadian workers' uh, retirement income and pension promises have been hitched to that wagon. And I think the, 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 what we wanna do is unhitch that wagon and connect instead our retirement incomes to social solidarity and a fair and balanced survivable world. Uh, so obviously to do that, we need to transform that structure altogether, not begging the executives to consider slightly different behavior, but really a transformation. And I would just make the point that's gonna call on us to build a political movement that will challenge things at the level of the government that has set this thing up and that has the authority to change its mandate. I'll just add one detail that I didn't say, but I should have said at the outset, uh, just so people know, prior to 1999, the Canada Pension Plan actually did have a, a smaller reserve fund, but it was not invested in these terrible, predatory, and destructive ways. It was actually invested by uh, loaning money to provincial governments to build hospitals and highways and schools and other public infrastructure that meets social needs. This was not the most profitable way of, of lending these reserve funds, but it was socially beneficial far beyond whatever the, the profits that were generated. And there is nothing to stop us from returning to that model of pension provision, uh, but it's gonna take a political movement to get there. Thank you, Kevin. Our next question is from Lisa North. Um, Lisa wants to know, the Norwegian Pension Fund has a reputation for ethical behavior. Is it deserved? And does it provide an example for the reform of the Canadian Fund? Thoughts from our panelists? I mean, I'm certainly not an, an expert on the Norwegian Pension Fund, but I do also understand it to have a completely <laughs> different approach to the Canadian one and and to be one that has worked into its structure both responsibility and fiscal responsibility to the the people whose pensions it's holding as well as a social responsibility and, and this is not sort of a a separate side commentary or like fancy language in its annual report this is a core part of its policies and it has procedures that it follows to look into whether or not it should divest from certain companies based on criteria. I don't think it's it's perfect. And I know there have been activists in Norway who wanted to divest from certain companies and it hasn't, but it has, at least has, has, has taken real action um, to remove Norwegian funds from companies that are seen to be egregiously abusive. Um, and I, I think it is a very clear and copyable model it's 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 not something that is sort of uh oh we can only imagine what a radical perspective might be no like this is happening and this has worked for many many years and i understand it to be financially successful as well um yeah i'll leave it at that for now but i i would want to look in, more into it to know what activists on the ground in norway feel about how it's working out right now Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So the next question is to the Brazilian panelists. Um, 
Is there really hope that Lula and his party, if they get a majority, can reverse these privatization schemes and pursue a policy of not only a Green New Deal, but of massive nationalizations to stop the looting and compensate the workers and public at large if he chooses to be an, an eco-socialist president? Um, Fabiola or Denise? Denise, do you have any thoughts? So, in fact, we have here a very complete platform that was launched yesterday by the coalition of President Lula. It's not only one party, but seven parties in coalition. They are together and are making a new movement where our major goal is to really do away with this fascist government that was established in Brazil. We have the hope that some issues related to privatization are reviewed and are reversed if they are going to be reviewed as a whole or as we know it. First of all, we don't know because it's a, co a coalition of different parties with different thoughts, but they all have a trend which is to be progressive. All of our agendas, regardless of the labor uh, agenda or environmental or developmental uh, agendas, they were all very much attacked. So it will be a process of reconstructing Brazil that cannot take place only in four years. We are very clear about this. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiola. Adi, Denise, do you have thoughts on this? Okay, I'm going to move on. Fabiola muito bem colocou. Yes, Fabiola said it very well. Our hope, the hope of the Brazilian people, of the workers and public companies, state-owned companies that were taken in such a sordid way. President Lula, together with a group of people who will work with him, can in fact start doing this nationalization of systems such as Eletrobras, water and sanitation systems, the great utility companies that provide access to the population is fundamental to guarantee the governance we need. So our hope is that uh, the Brazilian people will be with President Lula in this task. But in four years, as Fabiola said, will not be enough to promote this reconstruction because what was done after uh, Dilma's, uh, the coup against Dilma is really, they are destroying everything, our industrial, uh, our industries, and they are taking the people to poverty. So it's, uh, uh, Lula is going to find a very different country from uh, what he got, the country he saw when he was first elected. Uh, this, uh, the greed that took over this country and destroyed most of it. We will need a lot of unity and solidarity from all the different parts. Brazil has an in international relevance and it's fundamental that we restructure ourselves so that the international partnerships can continue in a very healthy and uh, uh, fraternal way. Thank you. Thank you, Adi. The next question, we have two quick questions for oh. Catherine and for Rachel. Um, Catherine, is there a list of the companies the CPPIB is invested in that are complicit in Israeli apartheid? And for Rachel, a very similar question, where can we get a list of the weapons manufacturers the CPP is invested in? I'll start with Catherine. Yes, there is that list, and I will actually put that link in the chat. Um, and also the, um, the UN database on businesses involved in the illegal Israeli settlements that I mentioned. Um, I'll put that link in as well, because that also lists all of the um, countries of whose uh, <laughs> are home states to the corporations that are involved in this illegal uh, Israeli enterprise. Thank you, Catherine. Rachel. 
Yes. So I will first of all drop in the chat uh, World Beyond War's divestment page on our website, worldbeyondwar.org slash divest. It has way more than just what the CPVIB is invested in. But if you uh, scroll down to where it says um, top weapons investments by various countries and states. We, I have the list up there from last year's numbers. And then the ones I just crunched from this year's, I can, I can throw in the chat for now and I'll, I'll get them updated on the site very soon. Um, that was just though, I want to say those nine companies I listed, those were just crunching the top 25 arms dealers in the world. Which of those 25 is the CPP currently invested in? Once you look into sort of secondary weapons involvement, or as I highlighted, RBC's involvement sort of at a secondary level, like it's it's much bigger than that. But yeah, I'll throw those nine companies and what mil what millions are invested in them currently by the CPP into the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you, Catherine. Um, so the last question uh, that I'm going to take for this evening is from Kumri. Um, Kumri wants to know, it doesn't seem democratic that the board of directors is appointed, not elected. Has any MP tried to change this through a private member's bill or otherwise? And how can we change this? Um, so uh, perhaps we can start with uh, someone who's been thinking about that on the ground in Canada. So again, uh, Bianca, I can take a stab at that. Um, I think the short answer is no. I don't think proposals around sort of democratizing that representation have been formulated. Uh, frankly, there really hasn't been a lot of organizing around this institution. It's a very, it's a fairly obscure body that people don't know a lot about. And uh, there's not a lot that, that has been happening. I will just add, and I put this, uh, uh, I, I explained this uh, elsewhere. There, there was one, I think, very limited uh, proposal, a private member's bill along these lines from um, an NDP MP from British Columbia. I forget the name right now, but it was a proposal to add to the CPPIB mandate, a kind of a human rights or a social and human rights screen uh, to ensure that, that the, its investments would be uh, you know, socially responsible or ethical or something like that. Uh, and, you know, frankly, uh, while I appreciate the intent, um, I think it's a, it's a very limited scope for this kind of proposal. In particular, as long as the institution is, is mandated to maximize its profits, uh, there's going to be a tension with an attempt to, to be, you know, socially and environmentally positive, but also maximizing profits. I mean, frankly, if you're asking of, if a body is mandated to operate in a in a in a profit maximizing way, I think we all know that the, this is the result of what we've been reviewing, and and that is what really has to be transformed. I think adding a modest screen, frankly, I would even say this: adding a more representative board, even from workers or unions or social movement organizations, if they are then charged with then maximizing profits they will struggle to find a way to do this. Uh, and, and, and so I think we've got to think, yes, about representation and uh, democratization, but also about like the fundamental structure that's in place. Thank you, Kevin. Um, unless any of our panelists have any final words, um, I think that's all that we have time for today. I want to thank you all so much for being a part of this important discussion. Hopefully it's the first of many. Thank you for your rigorous research, for your activism, for your challenge to action. It's been uh, great to hear from all of you. Um, I also want to thank our translators. Um, as well as our uh, co-sponsoring organizations. Karen has been posting lots of information about them in the chat. Thanks to you and Gib and Karen Rodman for the work behind the scenes. Um, Thanks also to Karen for bringing uh, all of these groups together. Um, please do find out more about the work of uh, our panelists and these institutions and organizations, PSI, Mining Watch Canada, the BDS Coalition, Just Peace Advocates, World Beyond War Canada, and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. And if people listening at home are part of an organization um, that would like to be part of an intersectional network that's sharing information about the CPPIB and its investment in some of these problematic areas, military privatization, human rights, um, the climate crisis, um, please do get in touch with, uh, with 
uh, Just Peace Advocates. That's info at justpeaceadvocates.ca to learn more and to join this work. So let's take uh, the work of our panelists seriously um, and the words of our panelists. We're all invested in this. Um, we've got to challenge the notion that this is an arm's length um, organization. It is overseen by the government of Canada and it is bankrolling projects that undermine human rights and fuel the climate crisis. So let's hold the Liberal government accountable for this institution. So once again, thank you to our brilliant uh, panelists, thanks to the folks behind the scenes, to our incredible translators, and to you, our audience, for joining us and for your excellent questions. That's it yeah. for our event. Uh, good night, everyone. Denise, final word. Um minuto. Um minuto. Okay, yeah, one minute. One minute. I want to thank everybody. And when you talk about the importance of connections and uh, who is in the backstage, I want to thank Ewan Gibb uh, from Canada, living in Brazil, who's the coordinator of international relations and uh, union and networks internationally. And he's been making this connection with our brothers and sisters from Canada. And without him, this entire event would not have been possible. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And thank you so much, Ewan. It's been a pleasure working with all of you. Um, that's it for our event. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. Peace, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye.